Hello and welcome back to Ave Imperator Productions. This time we continue our look at scientific management and Taylorism. So last time we talked a little bit about the rise of the managers and the formation of the Taylorist uh, system and scientific management as it was integrated into the universities, the culture, and the work environment of the United States. And this time we're going to take a little bit closer look of the implications of this, what it meant for the people working, what it meant for the people becoming managers, and what it meant for the society uh, at large. So the managers, as I stated, came to exert great authority through the companies. And as the owners were replaced by stockholders and by boards and by different groups like this, the managers needed to have tight control to prove that they were doing something, doing something correctly, and that they were managing the system, so to speak. And the use of skilled labor in the early factories was an extreme detriment to these managers because the work was very difficult to quantify. The workers were capable of demanding things because they were necessary to the system. And the control was not as entirely in place as the managers would have liked that. So skilled labor was necessarily the ability to create something that society needed by yourself even if it was in the um, social environment of something like a factory or an artisanal workshop or something to that effect the ability to create something and to be in control of the system itself and to be able to set your own pace made the workers at this time very restless and not willing to completely conform to handing over what was effectively their autonomy to this group of managers. The people that were sitting there creating the things didn't feel like they needed someone else to tell them how to do this. And there was extreme unrest at this period uh, in all circles, uh, worker uprisings, um, revolts, uh, riots, different kinds of things like this. So. Scientific management had specific things that it needed to remove from the work environment in order to make the workers more pliable, to make the work more analytic and scientific, and to give themselves more control over the process in order to be able to more effectively say that they have a direct hand in affecting it and that their systems are efficiently working. These uh, qualities which they needed to remove from work were skill, pacing, and the total completion of a job. This came mostly in the form of mechanization and the machines which were used were specifically able to be used because of the scientific management techniques, the Taylorist table systems and things like this. Because these tasks were broken down and they were no longer about the skill of the individual worker, they became about the ability to constantly reproduce a single action or a very minute amount of action. Different machines, especially in the early days, were capable of um, doing a lot of these small tasks. And with the breakdown of the people, they were essentially attempting to turn them into something like machines themselves, where they were no longer um, creating something, but sort of moving along in a process. And the other huge upside for the managers of the introduction to different types of machines and machine systems in the factories was that now they could completely control the workflow. If they said that their factory produced 10,000 shoes an hour, it wasn't because the individual workers were sufficiently motivated to handcraft 10,000 shoes in an hour. It was because that was the rate of flow of the machine itself. So now you had these workers who weren't creating anything individually themselves, who weren't setting the pace of their own work, and then with the table system, they were also now no longer physically creating anything at all. They would do individual stitches on the shoe, they would uh, hammer on the heel, they would move different items down through the presses and put them on the machines. This 
led to a situation where the skill was no longer a quality that was held by the worker, and more and more of the skill was put into the machine itself, and the worker individually became more of an accessory to that machine, to the point where many managers actually referred to the individual workers as the person stationed on this machine, rather than the worker who was doing that job. Because at this point, the machines could be quantified, their work output could be written down, it could be logged, they were setting the pace, and it was up to the machines to carry out the work, and the uh, individual workers were simply supplementing this work. So as machines became better and better, and more and more of the skill was offloaded from the individual worker to the machine itself, the work that was to be conducted in especially the factories and the industrial settings became extremely monotonous, trite, and difficult for the average person to actually be able to put up with because they didn't get to see what it was they were doing, they didn't get to see what the finished product looked like, they weren't in control of what was happening, they were effectively treated like machines, subservient to actual machines. And because of this, the skill of the labor went down and down as the skill of the machines went up and up, and more and more unskilled labor, which was actually a new term around the turn of the 20th century, came to be uh, much more important. And initially, between about 1908 and 1926, the way that these different companies would advocate for people to um, flood into these different factories and to accept these highly monotonous and very uh, boring, awful work jobs and uh, was by increasing the wages specifically for these unskilled jobs. Uh, we'll talk about Ford in a little bit, but he was very famous for having a very high paying wage for his workers when he originally started, but at about 1926 this actually stopped and the average wage for unskilled labor fell as they had much less skilled labor and other kinds of labor and the average person who had been working in factories for decades and the school systems which were taking lots of money from these business schools and who were putting out lots of managers came to shape the way that people thought to think of themselves and to think of work as a trite, dull, monotonous affair which was not creative and which was easily replaceable. And so as we see today with jobs becoming more and more automized, uh, automized and more and more replaced by machines. This is not because these machines are actually doing jobs that people can. This is because over a hundred years ago, people were molded to think, act, and behave like machines. With the explosion of throughput and with the managers bringing in more and more money for themselves and their companies, and with the average workers brought down to a lower level and for a time sufficiently compensated through higher wages to no longer be necessarily uh, upset, the rise and the success of scientific management began to boom and business schools went up all over the United States and Europe and these were huge cash cows and still are to this day for many of these university systems because they would take large donations from different uh, wealthy magnates and heads of businesses and corporations and different groups like this and they would feed into this system in order to continue the feedback loop of the scientific management as being this revolution and as being necessary. There were books written about how scientific management was going to revolutionize the world. As I had said earlier, it had been called repeatedly the greatest contribution to social theory of the United States to the Western world. And it really began to dominate and in a very real sense continues to dominate the way that we do our work up to this very day. The Even the unions in the period between 1908 and about 1930 began to accept unskilled laborers into their craft and their specialist unions in an attempt to 
gain some sort of control and to exert some sort of influence. And from this point forward, the unions would be much less a force supporting the workers and much more a force that was integrated into this new scientific management system. The ultimate realization of scientific management was, of course, Henry Ford's production line. This was the pinnacle of the highly specialized machine with the completely unskilled worker, acting in unison to produce a product which the individual workers had no relation to whatsoever. As I'd stated earlier, the original draw for this was the fact that they were paid quite well, but as different car manufacturers and as competition rose, this became much less of a reality, especially after 1926. The Ford man, as he was called, was not specialized. He didn't have any unique skills. The only thing that was important to Henry Ford and his employers was that they thought as little as possible how quickly they could complete very simple and mundane tasks and how loyal they were to their company. They had HR, um, human relations departments that were spread throughout companies that were targeted specifically at figuring out how to make the employees more um, willing and more loyal to their company. This was the start of the outside work environment being as important as the inside. Henry Ford actually had agents who would follow his new workers around for periods of years and document how prone they were to alcohol, what they were spending their money on, how they interacted with their family and their society, and different things like this, because the workers now needed to be as rigorously studied and regimented as possible, because they were no longer specialists who could be relied on to complete a task which they innately knew how to do. They were now subjects to the machines, which were the specialists. And this breakdown of skill and of the specialized nature of different people and the moving of it to a, uh, an instrument, a machine of some kind, is the direct connection to things such as offshoring, to things such as fully automized plants, which in and of themselves, well, offshoring probably isn't a good thing, but automization in and of itself isn't a bad thing. It only becomes a problem when it's replacing a task that a person would have done, but as we stated earlier, this wasn't the original working conditions of people, of working people. This was not how the average person worked. It took a lot of time, effort, money, and social control to exert a system which could come to dominate the workers and get them to act like machines. And once they acted like machines, it was inevitable that they would be replaced by machines. John Ralston Saul is a great Canadian philosopher. He has studied uh, the United States and other Western countries, and he has uh, shown that somewhere between a third and a half of the workforce in these different nations are managers. And he also pointed out that over the past 30 to 40 years, the definition of unemployment has been redefined dozens of times. And every time it does, the number goes down. So. Scientific management took the average worker and removed their specialization from them and gave that to a machine which was rigorously controlled and studied by a manager. And this system overall has created an air of the person whose work can be broken down being replaced by a machine for the good of someone who needs to be able to study that machine. This is the ultimate realization of the rationalization of the, bureauc uh, the bureaucrats and the managers from the late 19th century and early 20th century. And the institution of best practices in office environments, the unwillingness for management in different sectors to allow um, different people within organizations today to attempt new or different ways to do anything the easily replaceable nature of everyone within our economy today can all be traced back directly to scientific management and Frederick Taylor. All right, thank you very much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. This is something that I don't think it's talked about a lot, and it's another idea that we need to be able to understand and study as we go into talking about 
the 20th century and the 21st century, the things that we think about society, politics, philosophy, and that kind of thing. So if you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to subscribe. But until next time, remember, Ave Emperor.